like this virtually. Um, I'm Chandra Earl, and then Kat Chapman is going to be my other half sort of online today. Um, Kat, do you want to go ahead and say hello real quick? So, yeah, absolutely. Um, you can ignore my dog barking in the background, but uh, hi, I'm Kat Chapman, and I'll be the distinguished online helper today for uh, today's uh, virtual poster session. So thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for being here. Can you switch to me? So this year we have um, the People's Choice Awards. We do have a voting session going on for for eligible posters that you know we're we're able to um, we we're able to get sort of get in. There are there are three. There's going to be three different um, session. There we go. So we're going to have uh, three different categories for you to vote on. Um, so we've got the best in show. We've got the I had no idea that was even a thing. Um, if you guys, you know, kind of learn anything from these virtual presentations um, and the warm fuzzies. So poster that for whatever reason gave you a warm, pleasant, fuzzy feeling inside. Um, Every single poster presenter does have their individual Slack channel that you can go on and sort of talk to afterwards because these are kind of lightning talk-ish um, where they're very, very short and we're really only gonna have time for maybe one or two questions. But if you do want to, to talk to them, um, you can get to the virtual copy of their posters online and you can also, uh, you can also I said, go ahead and chat with them if, if you have any questions about their poster. Um, voting does end at end of day today because we will be announcing the winner tomorrow at the closing session. So please make sure you get your votes in. Um, I do have a QR code to both the voting form and the online posters, like all of them, if you guys want to get at that. And I'll put this up also at the end of this, just so you guys can put in your votes and we'll get that started. Okay, um, Kat, who's first? Uh, excuse me. Um, so we have Quas going first. Okay. Hope I'm saying that right. <laughs> okay. So hello, my name is Luise Kurs, and I'm talking about the EBB Cube R package today shortly. So um, to talk about the package, I'm going to start um, with the EBB Cube itself. And I'm going to skip the yellow part on the left and go directly to the green one. So there's a team at the IDEF in Leipzig who decided to map a data structure to the existing essential biodiversity variables concept. And they started by deciding that they are going to build it using NetCDFs, the so-called network common data form, which already comes with quite some conventions. So we are building on the climate and forecast convention CF and then adding more metadata terms based on the attribute convention for data discovery, ACDD, and then having more terms um, that are connected to the EBBs itself. So the result is a um, interoperable data structure for geospatial biodiversity data. And um, it comes with some basic infrastructure for now. So one is the EBV cube R package and one is the EBV data portal that Christian is about to present afterwards. So on the left side, you see the EBV cube, which has the classical um, dimensions, longitude, latitude, and time. And the fourth one that is called entity. So this can, for example, be different mammal species or um, ecosystem types. And on the right side, you see the hierarchical structure. So this is a nested structure. You will have always a metric and um, which can be, for example, species richness or relative species richness change. Um, and additionally, if you want, you can model these kind of things for different scenarios. So this is the next level. So in the end, you can have several EBV cubes in one EBV net CDF. And the package, oops, sorry, that I developed is, um, 
has basic uh, functionality. As these data sets can quite get a little bit complex, especially for people who are not very, um, co uh, yeah, do not use geospatial data that often, um, it uh, gives a basic overview about the um, EBB cubes that are available and maps them to the corresponding metadata and also bundles all the metadata <clears throat> for them. And then you can access the data, read subsets, um, you can visualize the data. And for me, the most important part currently is the data set creation, which is strongly interwoven with the um, EBB data portal, because you need to use the upload form on that portal to insert all your metadata that's um, currently the state to support the users with the metadata. And we're having a panel discussion about the EBV Cube, EBV Net CDF pro project tomorrow in the morning. And we're looking forward to feedback. So you're very, very welcome to come by and uh, see what's going on currently and yeah, help us. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? We have time for a couple. Okay, I'm not seeing any in person and I'm assuming there's none online. I don't see any questions from, from online, no. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Um, our next poster is Christian Langer. All right, so so my name is Christian Langer. I'm working as a WebGIS programmer at the German Center for Integrative um, uh, Biodiversity Research in Leipzig, Germany. And today I would like to introduce you our metadata catalog. Uh, we are we use to describe data sets. Uh, that are classified in uh, our EBV context. EBV is essential biodiversity variables are uh, divided into seven classes and um, um, used to monitor the status and trends in biodiversity change at multi-temporal scales. Um, and our EBV data portal is our platform to distribute and to visualize these EBV datasets. So the catalog um, uh, allows to uh, um, uh, or supports uh, spatial, multiple spatial temporal features and allows the user to browse the metadata in uh, ACDD standard, uh, which is in the JSON format and in EML, which is in XML. The catalog also offers a web-based interface where the users can filter and which you can see here and upload metadata and data based on the EBV metadata definition. The data upload itself is based on NetCDF as Louise said, is containing a hierarchical data structure and um, with a single click, the users can import these data sets into the map and calculate basic biodiversity change from a subset, let's say like a country over time. The data portal or the, the catalog has also a REST-based JSON API uh, for the integration, uh, share, and use of these EBV datasets. If you have any questions, don't hesitate <laughs> to ask. Thank you. All right, we have one in-person question. Thank you, Guillaume Body from the French Agency of Biodiversity. Um, I don't know for which, uh, who is the question, but 
does NetCDF, uh, can we put something that is not a raster, that is based on polygon, so to change the, the geographical information? And how does it man manage uh, confidence interval as there are often estimated values? We need to manage uh, the uncertainty of the value. So the first question, unfortunately not. It's only, uh, the portal supports only raster data sets. Um, so GeoTIFFs or NetCDFs. So unfortunately not no vector data, say polygon data. Um, uh, and the second question, I did not really, yeah, maybe Louise is the best. <laughs> um, oh, I, Give the mic to Nestor. Thank you. So first of all, I, I would like to invite all of you, as uh, uh, Luis said before, to the session tomorrow. We are going to discuss uh, some of those issues. But uh, by design, it doesn't include uh, vector data. And there's a re reason for that is because um, uh, this is um, a spatiotemporal series um, of uh, trends or states, in reality states, um, of different attributes of biodiversity. Yeah? So uh, capturing this in uh, with this format in, in shape files or in vector data could be difficult. But I mean, we are open in the future to explore other possibilities. For the second, yes, um, one of the dimension, one, one of the variables there, one or one, one of the um, yeah, uh, blocks in the hierarchical structure is metric. And this metric, you can add uh, uncertainty metrics there as you measure them. Yeah, you could have uh, they are the average, uh, one average estimate, but also the standard deviation or whatever you want. You can pack it all in the cube. All right, thank you. Do we have any questions in the Zoom? No questions in the Zoom so far. All right. Okay, next I believe we have... Um, Should be Walter Coke. Yep. Hey everyone. Um, my name is uh, Walter Koch from the Norwegian Biodiversity Information Center. Um, my poster is not just about Pokemon, it is also about Pokemon, mm -hmm. um, but um, about a format we're proposing for the storage of identification key information. Uh, we've made Clavis because we've been working for a number of years on a way to better store uh, identification key information. Um, identifications are the basis of a lot of the things we do here. It's all based on someone identifying a species in the correct way. And the way you normally do that would be through an identification key, which is often gonna be quite hard to use for a novice user. And they're always hard to make for the experts. It's a lot of work. Um, we've been working on that with experts for a number of years now, storing all of the data in a tabular format. So you have your, your species as, as uh, columns and you have your traits as rows and you connect the two through values. And we increasingly find that that is not covering all of the needs that we have and all of the things we want to store about the species and the traits, but also the links between them. So we want to be able to store things like uh, geographical, machine readable geographical information. Uh, we want to have a hierarchical taxonomy. We want to have multilingualism all built in there. We want to have uh, a lot of metadata on people, institutions, uh, multimedia, uh, further reading, stuff like that. Um, and there's no, we didn't find any format covering uh, what we needed. So we made a JSON schema uh, defining how to write all of this in, in, in an unambiguous way in JSON. And we call it Clavis. It's uh, out in uh, a, a preprint of a paper that is currently under review where we use Pokemon as a, as a tax taxonomy to illustrate all of the features because we don't want taxonomies coming in and well actually the species is not that's not the point that so um also i want to emphasize that we purposely uh illustrate the format in and of itself 
not part of any implementation, our implementation or anyone else's, because implementations and interfaces will come and go, serve different needs, but we think, well, we hope that the format is here to stay and can be built upon. Uh, so we invite you to our GitHub or to Slack or just make a pull request, uh, talk to me. Um, I want to hear what you think. Thanks. Not so much a question, rather than um, could you tell the people from the executive committee who are looking at this poster thinking, oh, uh, that's a copyrighted image, why that is not an issue? Oh, no, 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 that is not an issue. Uh, I've been talking, I've been contacting the legal department of Pokemon several times. They will not get back to me. Um, so uh, instead of using like Pikachu as a, as a probably trademark, copyrighted, all of that, uh, I used Stable Diffusion to generate uh, non-existent Pokemons, uh, picked the, the, the prettiest ones and made my own. So this is a, a whole genus of non-existing Pokemon that are exclusive to this audience. So don't worry. <laughs> And all, all CC by, of course. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, one more question. Um, so just just out of interest, so when taxonomists and researchers build their keys, there's a lot of information that you can derive from that, from all the research that have been they've done. <laughs> through backtracking to see which specimens don't have certain traits that are used. Does that take, does that use that or does that consider that? Well, this, this format is, is meant to store uh, kind of the conclusions of that, but we have uh, taken um, from the get go, made a lot of effort to represent uncertainty. So you can have traits that are sometimes the case or maybe, or uh, in certain regions with a certain frequency, but in other regions with other frequencies, you can have uh, custom like morphs and subforms of any taxonomic level to represent that if you want. Uh, so we do, um, we have built in features to support the conclusions of that, but the actual work of, of finding out what determines a species like morphologically, that that's a step that happens before it gets into the format. Next, we have Eric. Is Eric in person or online? Uh, I'm online. If... All right. Let me go ahead and get <laughs> you up, and you can go ahead and start. OK, go ahead. I apologize. My video is pretty washed out. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so I'm a uh, ecologist at the National Ecological Observatory Network in the U.S. Um, so I have a little different perspective than the previous speakers. So I'm working for a data provider. Um, <clears throat> and so for those of you who aren't familiar, um, we're a national observatory where we have um, 81 sites uh, where we will be collecting various types of ecological data for 30 years. And we're about three years into operations, but some sites have longer time series. So this poster here is um, focusing on an effort between NEON and the Environmental Data Initiative in the US, um, which is basically the government uh, funded, or National Science Foundation funded uh, entity that provides the data repository for um, projects like the U.S. Long-Term Ecological Research Program, things like that. And so in this uh, collaboration between our two groups, um, we wanted to have a more or less standardized data format um, that could be used by groups that were doing ecological synthesis work um, with a focus on um, like community counts and co different community metrics, things like that. 
And at the time, so this, this work began back in like uh, the early 2010s. <clears throat> and we had some specific needs from the synthesis groups that were using the data. Um, and so we essentially came up with a standardized format that's similar to, to um, like the event core for Darwin core, but not quite the same. Um, and this has been pretty useful for kind of having a, you know, um, for data interoperability between NEON and the LTER. And since, since, since then, um, we've been working on developing a pipeline for kind of leveraging this flexible intermediate data model to get um, NEON data into GBIF and also the LTER data into GBIF in a standardized way. And so in the middle of the poster, we have a map of um, basically co-located sites from NEON and the LTER. And there's a few different pathways that data get in, but for, so for LTER projects, those are often one-off or single PI projects. Um, some of them are ongoing. There's various challenges for how, um, how, we, how the EDI manages those data. Um, but when they get into the repository, there's, we, well, EDI now has an automated pipeline that's still in development, but we have some working examples where the data sets can go from the raw data package to this flexible intermediate and then get picked up by the code to put in a, a Darwin core, event core archive, and then on to submitting to GBIF. And so with NEON, we wanted to leverage this workflow. And so we have mappings for our data sets and our organismal data sets are listed in table one on the poster, and then getting those into the workflow and then essentially being managed by the same system to submit them to GBIF. Um, so like I said, this is in development. We have a kind of working model um, that EDI has developed and we have all the pieces um, developed. So we have the NEON mappings to the, to the Ecocom DP format. Um, we have a bunch of tools in the R package for using it to access data in that format and do some basic visualizations and working with the data sets. Um, in, in the next year, we're looking forward to kind of getting some uh, more working examples of, of this entire pipeline working. Um, the important thing is that because our data sets are constantly updated, um, as you know, this observatory goes on in the future, kind of dealing with the challenge of tracking that and not creating duplicate records in GBIF. Um, so that's something that we're working on as well. So happy to hear any questions from folks. All right, do we have any questions? Not in the chat, it looks like. Okay, next we have Ariana. Hi. Ariana. Hi. Hi, I'm online. <laughs> Can you hear me and see? Yes. Can you see me also? Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Let me get your poster up real quick. Yes. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Ariana Giannini from Sapienza University of Rome in uh, Italy, and I'm a PhD student. Today, I present to you a project that I'm carrying out with my research lab, which involves the digitization uh, intended as databasing of private invertebrate biological collections uh, here in Italy. First of all, why private collections? In Italy, as in other countries, uh, many specimens of uh, invertebrates are stored in house cabinets, uh, in some cases composing collection of high uh, taxonomic and uh, geographic reliability, especially when collectors have a strong naturalistic and uh, taxonomic background. Nevertheless, such type of data is little used in research because it's almost inaccessible. Specimens from private collections are often not uh, databased, and even where they are, they uh, rarely follow international standards. Therefore, this project aims to 
enhance uh, the accessibility of data from private collections, first supporting data owners with material, uh, materials information, and also technical help for a first proper transfer uh, of data from uh, labels, from specimen labels, um, to a simple standard Excel spreadsheet. And then thinking over the second phase uh, of the digitization process, which includes the standardization of both taxonomy and terms and uh, the georeferencing and also the cleaning of the, the data, the data set. Uh, we have almost completed the pilot phase of this project where we collected data on marine mollusks and we collaborated with uh, seven collectors, three of whom have already shared their data. Uh, to date, we have uh, collected and standardized, uh, standardized uh, more than uh, uh, 11,000 records of mollusks. And considering that we started data collections, collection in May and that my research group and uh, I were you know, uh, laymen in this field, I consider this a good, a good result. Um, one of the most important things for data collection was to find a common vocabulary and a simple method to request data from uh, uh, collectors. For example, some of them don't speak English or they are more familiar with, with terms like uh, determinavit rather than identified by uh, so um, it was very important to ask them uh, um, in a simple and uh, clear way the, the data that uh, uh, we needed. So uh, in the poster, you can see some uh, preliminary results. And uh, because we are talking about data from biological collections, we are talking about opportunistic data. So as you can see, uh, there is a strong uh, sampling bias. Uh, the time span of the data is quite recent, but uh, uh, we um, are also starting new collaborations uh, with other collectors to gather historical data. For now, we seek to expand the niche to, of uh, uh, collectors uh, we collaborate with, uh, hoping to become better and better at communicating with uh, data owners. Uh, and uh, also we hope to op optimize uh, the workflow of uh, uh, data collection and cleaning. So I guess that's all. <laughs> and thank you for, for your attention. And uh, if you have any question or suggestion, you can also find me on, uh, on Slack. All right, do we have any questions for Ariana? Okay, it doesn't look like we have any in person or online, so we'll go ahead and go to the next. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is Nut Hofstad here? Yay, okay. Hello, I'm uh, Knut Hofstad from uh, Norwegian Biodiversity Information Center, same as uh, Voter. And I, I wonder if you sh could show just the bottom part. Yeah, something like that. Uh, people can just leave it like that. Um, so I will. Um, I've made a quite simple poster uh, presenting the um, national infrastructure that we have in uh, Norway for uh, species occurrence data. Uh, and um, yeah, the, there are some principles behind this uh, infrastructure. It's um, um, modular uh, so that we have, a, we have a citizen science portal. Uh, we have a species map service. And we have uh, some things that are not shown in the um, in this uh, figure. Is uh, is um, we have a, a taxonomic, uh, a Norwegian taxonomic backbone. 
uh, and we also have things that we are trying to build like the like a trait bank connected to this infrastructure um the infrastructure all, uh, only deals in um, open data so uh, it can only handle open data but we have a parallel infrastructure for uh, um, uh, sensitive species data. Uh, Darwin Core is used as um, used for uh, exchange of data. Uh, the individual data owners, it can be from the citizen science portal, it can be uh, research institutes, it can be um, uh, natural um, history collections. They are responsible for uh, publishing their own data and manage, managing their own data. And they use uh, mostly the uh, IPT software from GB for that. Um, we then read in those data, uh, checks that the data are consistent with the Norwegian uh, taxonomic backbone and makes them available uh, in a, a map on the web. Uh, you can also access it, access it uh, through uh, BMS or through an API. And uh, it's used by um, the general public uh, edu in education. Um, it's actually used uh, in forestry, for example. Uh, they even have um, can read data from our map into the um, forest harvesting machines and display the observations in the machines to see how they where they should not uh, do any um, timber harvesting. Um, now what more to say? Uh, yeah, the the um, the infrastructure is it's quite uh, tightly integrated with um, uh, environmental management and spatial planning in Norway. So if you if you are doing spatial planning in Norway, you have to check this map and document that you have checked the map to to, to make a plan. Uh, and if you if you are going to to build a new road or something like that, and you do species mapping, you are also required to deliver the data to this map. If it's uh, if it's um, not for all species, but for red listed species and um yeah uh, more to say yeah i think that's it thank you do we have any questions i think the the abstract i've brought a quite long abstract so it's more information in the abstract okay, thank you so much Right, is Ben in person? Yes, hi. You can zoom in and now I'll just talk to him. <laughs> Annotations. Yeah. Hello, I'm Ben from the Natural History Museum in London. However, I'm a data architect. So this is looking at our process for developing a new um, data model for a collections management system. So it's part of the RECO project, which Steen spoke about on Monday and can give more context around that. And this is the process of how we went through it. So I will invite you to look at it in more detail, more than I can talk about at the moment. But the whole thing is looking from the inputs, including all the data standards we're talking about here and how they have an impact on it. But we need a data model primarily for our collection. So that involved almost starting from first principles, defining what a collection object actually is and working from there and building a model out. And the core of that is in the middle with a fairly complex collection object idea and tying into other concepts like the object group from Latimer Core. So we can describe our objects 
as fully as possible and build a system around that that our our users will enjoy using and use so we can get more data into it so we can get more data out to everybody here um we did lots of work we look at the data model in the top right the how it fits into our infrastructure and the global infrastructures in terms of swapping the data around and then we have more details here on what the key entities are about how we define a collection object as a single thing that you can almost just just pick up if you can do it and you can't just and you can't divide it it's a collection object but then that has the complications that it might just not be of one species so then we have separate ways of identifying that of, of determining what's in the collection object and how they're made up and complex relations between those entities and and self joins to each other to create other other things other relationships um and then we go through a process of taking narratives from our users and they just explain so this is a detailed list of a c sampling event and how that splits up into all the key entities in the model and one thing i want more now is lots more of these from our users but they're quite quite quiet um so that's that's how the model fits together the purpose here is is this is it's still a theory we're still we want to share it with more people to generate discussion and criticism of what we've done why we've done it and to introduce us to you so that's me if there are any questions I'm glad to hear them Hi, I'm Debbie. I was wondering, when you started the Recode project, can you tell us a little bit about the process that you went through, like meetings, listening sessions, interviews? How did you go about rethinking the model, the process with people? I think Sting's best to answer that because that was before I joined, which is just two years ago. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we did um, a bit more than two years, actually, of talking to our our stakeholders. So basically, you created a, a stakeholder landscape and then engaged in workshops <clears throat> around the different processes. Um, but not only that, we also included uh, registry and a lot of other uh, stakeholders to make sure that we had overlap of what the CMS actually needed to do. So and looking at that, so Be uh, Mike sitting here, who's our BA, uh, who went through that almost two years of that. And then Ben came in and sort of started looking at all that data and entities and how that fit in with what the users needed to do. So it's all of all, all the individual things need to overlap to some extent to work. Uh, but because we're very minded about the external community, we are also looking at the standards to make sure that we can then get that data out of the system to the community and not just internally. So Ben, you you took the data and I mean you took the information and did the magic for figuring out how you can use all that information to build a model. Yes, I like to think something along those lines. They harness my ignorance. I don't have a natural history background, so I was the one asking questions. What does that mean? How does that work? And going right back to it. And because we've got quite a diverse collection and the Natural History Museum, it means understanding what the common concepts are, what things seem to be very different, but actually from a data point of view, we're very similar. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Next we have Sophie. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Hi, everyone. Sophie Meus from uh, Mesa Botany Garden. Uh, with this poster, I want to present the project from Blue Iguanas to Blue Vervain. Uh, the project is about the, well, studying the impact of colonialism on the biodiversity and perceptions of biodiversity in two UK overseas territories, Cayman Islands and the island of Montserrat in the Caribbean. Uh, to give a bit of context, so researchers, naturalists, collectors 
from the global north. Uh, four centuries have been going down to the Caribbean, taking data, collecting data, specimens, going back home, um, taking all those specimens back home. And um, with the consequence that now, um, all this, this huge body of biodiversity knowledge is um, disconnected from the local communities and um, not openly accessible often for those local communities while they need this uh, knowledge for uh, conserving and protecting the local biodiversity. Um, so the project want to uh, study these research practices, but also make recommendations and um, um, you know, formulate best practices um, both for local communities and international researchers and the research community to um, what, what are the best ways to um, connect those two communities and how they both can uh, maxim maximally uh, benefit from uh, research on the islands. Um, one of the outputs of the project is the species interaction network over there um, that we generated around the um, endemic endangered blue iguana from Grand Cayman. Uh, so to construct this, we used uh, already available data in uh, Globi, the Global Biotic Interaction Database, but we also mobilized interaction, species interaction data from uh, the literature. And uh, we also used uh, GBIF to, in the end, um, come up with this network. And these kind of species interaction networks are really great. Uh, to be used in education, to talk about ecology, um, teach about ecosystems and show people how everything is connected, uh, what the place of us humans is in, um, in the ecosystem, but also our pets, uh, as you can see, the cat over there, uh, but also what the impact is of um, bringing uh, alien species into the ecosystem. Um, and the alien species in this case is the green iguana in the network. Um, when we went there this summer, uh, we organized a bio blitz and um, we also promoted the iNaturalist app to give the people there, both professional, uh, professionals and non-professionals, a tool uh, with which they can uh, collect high quality data and use it for research and conservation. And um, we also looked into um, who did and does research on the islands, who are those people uh, who collected specimens there uh, in the past, but also now. And um, actually that is what Quinton will talk more about tomorrow. It's all about disambiguating people, collectors. Uh, so if you scan, this QR code, you get to that abstract. So do come and watch the talk. Um, I know we aren't supposed to bring our posters here, but um, I have mine in my <laughs> back pocket. So if you want to look in more uh, <laughs> detail, I will have it in my back pocket till the end of the conference. So please come and find me or, um, Find me on Slack if you have questions. Thank you. Any questions? It makes a nice tablecloth. <laughs> I'm not seeing any online either. Okay. All right, well, thank you so much. Next, we have Samira. Yes, do you hear me well? I, I let me put you up real quick. Okay. Do you want me to move this to a specific spot? Okay, great. 
So do you hear me though? I think so. You good? Okay. So yeah. hello everyone, I'm Samira Wabalu, a postdoc researcher at the Aino project. I know is a platform for knowledge graph generation and management at the biodiversity data. Uh, on my poster on the left side, you see a sample data source from IDIP, which shows, for example, which species observed in which botanical garden and with which ID and which years and, and when they start flowering. So for uh, every given data set, we convert, we use a set of tools to convert to them to the knowledge graph. As you see here, there's a sample knowledge graph. What we do exactly is that uh, we, we follow a workflow of knowledge graph generation, which, was, which I show it on the top on the right side. Uh, a user needs to be authorized, first of all, in, in our platform, then they upload the data sets. After that, if they want, they can clean the data set. And the next step is that we, uh, we extract the entities here. For example, on my graph, on, on this example graph, we extract uh, the entities, for example, for every column here from the table, for example, a species, garden, or um, ACC species ID. And then once we extract uh, the entities, we build a relationship between them. For example, we say species is monitoring this garden and other relationship. And then with that, we have the schema of the graph. And once we have the schema, we uh, populate the instances. Um, for example, every cell on this table will be instances of this graph. Uh, one more point we do here is that we, uh, every entities in knowledge graph should be interlinked and have a global ID. So we currently support to make them uh, hyperlink to the Wikidata pages, which I show also some sample here. And once this graph is built, the user can publish it in our repository, but uh, well, you can also take more, more steps. For example, you can check the quality of the graph. You can uh, augment the tree paths, you can build a query template, or you can refine the schema. Uh, there are planned functionalities that we will do in our future work. And once the graph is built, uh, this is not all, once we have the graph, we, uh, we aim to query the graph with a Sparkle query or predefined templates. Uh, and once we have the graph, we visualize it, we can update the graph, and also during the knowledge graph generation, uh, we save every step that, as a, you know, that the user follow to create this knowledge graph. And we save this step as a workflow. So uh, you or um, other users can uh, load this workflow and all the steps that uh, for this uh, knowledge graph creation. We can load the workflow and rerun it, and then we reproduce the graph. And also we use that information for provenance tracking and giving the provenance information. If you are interested, uh, read our paper or visit our website. I'm happy to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. right, do we have any questions? Okay, well, we're going to move on to our last presenter, which is going to be Anahita. I would not like. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to keep it short and sweet as the last presentation. My name's Anahita Kazem. I'm based at IDIV, um, an institution in Leipzig, Germany, already introduced by both Christian and Luisa earlier on. And my poster is really about one simple proposition, that at IDIV, I'm leading a project that is trying to build a dedicated data repository for a specific type of data. Um, these are species abundance and assemblage data sets. So effectively site by species matrices, um, often where the locations have been sampled at multiple time points. Now, anybody attending this conference is probably well aware that there's been a lot of emphasis um, already on specimen collections on occurrence data sets. And increasingly we have linked data infrastructures to handle those. But when it comes to species abundance data, this is still much more scattered um, often hidden in gray literature, in reports by NGOs, and often written in languages other than English. 
So our goal here is to gather, to harmonize, and to mobilize these data sets in a fair and open way. We really want to be a one-stop shop. So we would be covering all realms, terrestrial, marine, and freshwater, um, data from any geographic location, and both legacy data, which probably needs quite a bit of retrospective metadata enrichment, and also, for example, data from current monitoring programs. Um, already within our research group, we have collected, I believe, over a thousand data sets that are ready for upload with no repository to put them in yet. So we're at quite an early stage of building the repository. What I'm doing at the moment is collecting user requirements, also working with developers to produce a graphical user interface for entering metadata, because these particular data sets are quite onerous when it comes to uploading metadata. In order for these data sets to be reusable, um, you really need to have a lot of contextual information about sampling methodology and sampling effort. Um, so we're trying to make it easier for people to put all the right information in um, by, in a way, heavily controlling how they can give the responses and what they're asked. We're also currently working on the code that will automate generation of Darwin code archives and bulk registration of um, these archives with GBIF. So make your connection to the earlier presentations. These data sets are effectively the raw observational data that complements the model geographic projections that are used in the EBV portal, um, already presented by Luisa and Christian earlier. Um, and I'd be happy to take questions. I'd be even happier if you know of data sets that you'd like to contribute. Um, and I'll be available on Slack and afterwards here. Thank you. So I have a data set in GBIF and I guess probably other people do. Is that useful to you or is it already suitable where it is? Well, certainly there's already a lot of relevant data out there in online repositories or with aggregators like GBIF. And I think we would be in the business of trying to restructure it and harmonize it with what we hold. Um, I think we'd like to complement, not be in competition with other repositories, for example. And so there are some that hold more focused, um, smaller collections of data like biotime which focuses on bio um, time series where here we've already spoken about you know bringing them in under the umbrella with their own branding but if your data is already out there the first thing we do is point to it you know hold metadata about it um, depending on where we go we might actually bring in other open data restructure it in order to make it more usable with our stuff All right, so we'll just give one last round of applause for all of our poster presenters. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, so we do have quite a bit of time left, uh, but I did want to open, you know, it to the floor to a give any general questions that you might have, or you talk, you know, talk to any of your poster presenters. But B, oh, also Rukaya, did you want to present? No, okay. Um, or I also wanted to ask you guys what we could have done differently in this because this is kind of our first you know hybrid way of doing posters and i think there's definitely some pros and cons on how to do this but i want to also get like feedback from you guys for next year um in case this does go hybrid again so i think one major thing we kind of forgot slash didn't think about was putting posters up, right? Putting posters up and slides up, I think are two very different things. I made it very difficult for, I think, us to read some of these posters, but I do like having the digital versions personally. Yeah, has anybody done hybrid poster presentations or hybrid poster sessions at meetings yet? No, I see head staking, no. Any yes, anybody? 
Last year we did this, but of course it was all virtual. Um, they are, the files are, I mean, I think you can view them online, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So you could zoom in on your own. So there's no, yeah. Say, Shelly, come, you want me to, you can I'll run to Shelly. So yeah, I just had it open and could zoom in while everyone was talking and pointing. So that helped. Come on up, conversation. Uh, it might be useful to have uh, annotations and comments available throughout the conference that the speakers can address. If they are up and available and people can put in comments and there can be chat about the, the, the poster from the general attendees, then there is, there's a lot more to respond to and they might be given more attention as well. Um, correct me. Um, well, there's Slack channel for each poster. Was it linked to the yeah, I meant image for each one? Yeah. Yeah. So in Slack, there's a channel for each poster and in each one of those channels, there's a link to the poster so you can actually see it and look at it. Yeah. I was and, thinking more about on the poster, you know, you, you put your annotation on a comment on the poster. So it's a, like a post-it note or another. Yeah. So that you can address a specific area or you can point to something and you can comment. Could be more interactive, more fun. I don't know. I think, like I said, I think you also made a good point. It could probably have been advertised a bit better that these were kind of, you know. Everything can always be better. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, on a completely different note, um, one of, obviously posters are pretty good for like, early kind of career things and they can also be used for people who don't want to talk and <laughs> yeah. which then everyone has had to talk who has submitted a poster so th that was just a, a feedback maybe that I don't know if there are other ways of doing it you could record a video or because these are almost like lightning talks at this point which right. are really cool but are a different thing to a poster so I, I don't know I haven't got a solution I'm raising yeah. problems but think, just a yeah general point I think like doing it like this takes away that like conversational aspect of it that's one of the, again, one of the biggest things that I was like oh okay but it's much better than having nothing so I, I think it actually worked really well and it's really nice to hear the person give a nice little introduction to it and then you can go and deep dive and find the information later so I liked that aspect of it yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would also agree. So if you are deciding to have a J virtual poster sessions, so just virtual, then it would make sense to allow maybe different formats. So not only restrict on PDF. So for instance, you can have a, I don't know, in Prezi. I don't know. If, oh, yeah. Okay. So where you can point from the left bottom or top right, something more digital. Not right. only PDF, right. because PDF is just uh, for, it is perfect for presenting in person uh, as a printed material, but virtually is not really, uh, uh, maybe not the best method. <laughs> um. The other microphone. I would say one thing that is a little bit different that some of you, I think, have picked up on that makes these posters different from other conferences is that they are not ephemeral, which is to say they get connected to the abstract in the journal. So one of the things that I, someone just mentioned, was it you, that early career sort of, I don't want to, for me, I think sometimes posters are extremely creative. It takes thought when done well to organize the information in a way that's engaging and meaningful on the page. And when you take the time to do that and you present it at a professional conference and maybe five people walk up to your poster, it's a lot of effort and time into something that could be incredibly useful. And I'm not talking just about the content on the slide, I'm talking about the structure the way the information's organized and communicated so that other people look at that and go, oh, I see how that tells a story. Or, I see how that information tells, um, communicates in a way that I can benefit from and use myself. But those posters go away. And so having this as a resource and being able to go back 
it's a, it's a lot like being able to illustrate what you want to say. It's an incredible opportunity. And from our journal standpoint, your poster is a lot longer lived as a resource. So there's that. It's not the same as a poster presentation at a conference where it's up on a wall for a day and then goes away. But yeah, how to do it hybrid. More thoughts? Yes. I, I would like to have a, a physical poster as well. Um, so, I mean, it can still be hybrid if you, if you have the discussion and everything online, but you can also look at posters during, uh, during lunch or, or coffee breaks. Um, I, I can see how that's different for, for people attending online, how to get their poster here, but I guess it could be done somehow. Well, I'm wondering in that case, if we'd have to make people make, make people, oh. I'm wondering in that case, if we would have to like make people record their presentation then. No, no, I'm talking about the actual poster. No, 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 yeah, 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 I know. Yeah, just a thought about this. It might be actually nice to have like one big screen on a, in a lobby where it's, they are just sort of just one by one going after each other. Oh, uh, okay. Sorry, I'm jotting down your notes. Got it. <laughs> So just one quick comment on the Prezi, um, Prezi thing. We, we tried doing that in ours. There's actually small icons where you can fly about uh, and look at different content on the poster. So within PDF, you can actually assign links and define the zoom, zoom level when you click that link. So you can actually sort of travel around. And we tried to do that because we thought that'd be fun, but, but people have to go in on the poster first. <laughs> So just add one thing to that. As a presenter, I wouldn't like to be standing up and navigating at the same time for a wide audience. So it would have to be a, I wouldn't mind standing next to a laptop out there and explaining it, but having the having the physical poster on display so people can look and then having a, a stand somewhere where you can go into further detail and do those specific, look at those specific detailed areas. And that's more of a, a dialogue thing than a presentation thing for me. Yeah, I completely agree with that. <laughs> I didn't have to really present, but I would have said the same thing. They seem to like it. <laughs> yeah, we're getting good feedback that it's worked well for them. They haven't said much though, so you can chime in more if you would like. Kat, do you have anything to jump in here and add? Um, yeah, not, not too much feedback, um, from the zoom chat. I mean, we got a couple of, of comments saying like, we did a great job and thank you. And that, uh, people seem generally happy with this hybrid format. Yeah. So I think that's a good thing. Um, yeah, I, I think I can agree with pretty much everything that's been said already, you know, that conversational aspect of a traditional in-person poster session, like we're kind of missing out on that here, but it's really hard to emulate virtually. So I'm not sure what the least worst way would be to uh, kind of emulate that in per or in a hybrid in a hybrid setup but uh, you know i think having this is better than not having it right i completely agree with you okay um make sure you vote please remember make sure you vote cuz uh, the winners will be announced tomorrow um thank you all for coming and giving us feedback and kind of sitting through this with us um, I was just going to add one thing. There is some conversation happening in a couple of the Slack channels, so don't forget that you can still engage there. Yes, these are still online. You can look at them. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. I'm, uh, can you guys put? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you all so much. Um, You're free to go. Remember, when does the bus leave? Uh, 7.15? 7.15 tonight at the front. Be there. Yep.